Thank you very much. Um, our next presentation is by Ahmed Kanna. Dr. Kanna teaches anthropology and human geography in the School of International Studies, University of the Pacific. His publications include Dubai, the City as Corporation, and Rethinking Global Urbanism, along with numerous articles that have appeared in Cultural Anthropology, City, Journal of Urban Affairs, Review of Middle East Studies, Merib, Jalaliyah, and various edited volumes. He's currently working on the Global South City and Urbanism as objects of expertise. Now what his um, uh, printed um, blurb doesn't say is that before he became an academic superstar, Ahmed Kanna was uh, organizer of the Middle East workshop at Harvard University as a graduate student, and that was the way that I became introduced to Middle East studies at Harvard as an MA student, and the reason that I studied at, um, in that program. So there's, um, I think he should add that to the list of his, um, his, his, uh, his, his accomplishments. Anyway, the, the title of his talk today is Gulf Urbanism, the Semantic Field of a Category of Space. Please welcome Ahmed Kanna. Thank you, Ali Reza, for such an uh, unexpectedly warm, uh, I, mean, I, I expected it to be warm, but I didn't expect the last bit. That was really nice and brings back some really great memories with uh, some of our, some of the teachers that we've shared in the old days. Um, and thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, University of Chicago, for convening this, um, this amazing meeting. Uh, it's really my pleasure to, to, uh, to take part. Um, so my paper, uh, it, I, it won't offer any um, uh, of the wonderful sort of empirical richness that we've seen with, um, the, with um, uh, Alan's paper. Um, I'm not going to be making any definitive statements. I'm uh, rather going to be making some um, proposals for uh, research questions as they pertain to the city and urbanism in the Gulf and how and, and potential ways in which these questions might open up into uh, broader questions of global urbanism, what, what is sometimes called global urbanism, what I call global south urbanism. Um, uh, and, um, and so I will say what I have to say and hopefully uh, you will give me questions instead of rotten vegetables at the end. Uh, okay, so um, I'm deploying this uh, anthropological linguistic concept of the semantic feel to think about um, not cities per se, but how we even come to understand and formulate our questions about how about research projects and um, policy projects pertaining to urbanism in the Gulf. Uh, as Ali Reza mentioned, uh, my own work has focused primarily on Dubai, although I do have some experience in Bahrain and and in uh, Kuwait as well. Uh, so I'll use to Dubai um, uh, as my main example here, but some of this I think can apply to other parts of the uh, Arab or Persian Gulf. I have no stakes in that construction. Um, work on Dubai, um, my own work on Dubai has, um, uh, has been inspired by other critical work that is uh, engaging with and critiquing um, the notion of representation and what, what I feel following other scholars looking at other cities and other time periods have critiqued as the privileging of, of, rep of representation in writing about the city. What does this mean more specifically? Well, questions like what cultural identity can be read off this or that building, this plan, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, family does, uh, does it, uh, family honor, does it, uh, reflect upon what does it all mean, you know, symbolically. These kinds of questions. Um, I've, I've tended to find that this has been an overemphasis in work on Gulf, um, on the Gulf in general, and on Gulf urbanism in particular, which I've found to be in thrall of representational approaches, questions of identity, and uh, and so on. And this approach really never appealed to me. Um, rather, I ask and have tended to always ask, how do specific representations and systems of signification get materialized as built objects, as built projects? How are these projects used? Whose point of view, social status, class status, or privilege um, do these include? Who gets excluded? As the um, architectural critic and historian Diane Girardo said many years ago in a, a book um, uh, on, entitled The Social Function of Architecture, what gets built and for whom? 
Uh, this so sounds like a very simple question, but it's actually, um, if you look at my own book on Dubai, I, I try to unfold this question uh, in as much complexity as I, as I could. As we all know, there has been a proliferation of, of social scientific and particularly urban knowledge on the so-called Gulf City, at least since the year 2000. The analytical category of the urban Gulf uh, is one that I'd like to subject to some analysis here. What kinds of claims does, the, does this category make possible? And what kinds less possible? So this is what I've, I call Gulf urbanism discourse. Um, this seems to be, this uh, the, the talk about Gulf cities, city talk, seems to be especially salient in particular historical moments and conjunctures. Um, in the moment of post-oil modernity, uh, and neoliberalism generally, uh, the Arab uprisings especially come with a, a renewed emphasis and uh, intensification of Gulf urbanism discourse in contexts such as journalism on the, on the Gulf by Western and local journal, uh, writers, academic conferences, especially um, uh, urban academic conferences in particular. So my work is what I, is uh, going against the naive realism that I that I see in these representational approaches. I invert the common sense notion that the proliferation of urban knowledge production on the Gulf over the past 15 years or so is a consequence of the urban projects that have been undertaken during this contemporary period. Rather, I try to show that the situation is more complicated and may in fact be the reverse. That, to use a linguistic analogy, the sign of the city and the semantic field in which it is situated help to constitute the arena in which certain forms, of built are, certain forms are built and certain kinds of urban spaces become imaginable and take shape. Rather than assuming uh, we know to what the term urban or city refers or asking what is the city, implying a theory of representation which goes beyond and com which goes beyond and compounds the problematic notion of identity. I think a better way of thinking about urban questions is to ask, what does the, cat the very category of the city do? Excuse me. And how does it operate in contexts of politics, uh, widely understood urban politics, cultural politics, geopolitics? So, um, there's two parts of this paper. Uh, one is on the semantic, what I call the semantic field itself, and then one on the practices that um, that materialize um, this this field. Um, so when we look at, and in a longer version of this paper, I look at um, I look at um, materials, more uh, documents, and blog posts, and academic papers, and so on, uh, much more closely. Um, but in this in this literature, which I review, much of it being produced. Um, in, um, in uh, settings in which urban experts are collected, congresses, conferences of urban experts who are asked to, 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 to um, present about solutions to supposed problems of Gulf urbanism. Much of this literature and the journalism that is related to it in, 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 uh, in the bigger, uh, uh, bigger discursive field operates with a pretty clear set of binary oppositions. So on the one side, the GCC versus Yemen, Iraq, and Iran. So notice uh, Yemen, interestingly. I, that's the first thing I noticed. It's not on this map, you know? Um, why? You know, Yemen, uh, 750,000 Yemeni workers work in Saudi Arabia, at least, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, right? Um, the GCC versus Yemen, or Iraq, or Iran, or what, depending on the, the, the segmentary logic of the situation. Uh, Gulf urbanism, which seems here to be the marked category, versus uh, Middle East, North African urbanism more generally. Global versus regional. Cosmopolitanism versus regionalism, localism. Rulers and experts, consultants, neo good neoliberal subjects, versus those who are not elites, non-rulers, non-experts construction workers, tribe, tribal types, you know. Um, agency, agentive act activity on the one side, the rulers uh, are always doing things, you know, they're pulling people forward, uh, the consultants are applying their expertise and so on, versus passive, the people, you know, we're 
just hanging out, waiting for the ruler to do stuff, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, city, sit, urban space is inert until some expert acts on it. Um, and so on and so forth. There's many others. Um, so I talk about this again in a longer version of this paper in much greater detail. Um, so let me talk about how this is practiced in general. So I gave one example, the, the brochure cover of this is a kind of map. Um, mediation in general is a kind of, uh, it's a beautiful brochure by the way, it's nothing, it's, it's, not, it's not anything against this, this, this the art, artwork here. Um, so I look at maps um, and other kinds of geographical representation as a particular field in which um, these binaries and their connotations are materialized. So, um, you know, human geographers tend to make a distinction between what they call representational maps, such as these, and non-representational kinds of geographies. So, um, a, a kind, the ways of talking about f emotions and feel, how you feel um, when you, you know, use an urban space and how you circulate and the, the less kind of positivistic, the, le the kinds of geographic experience that lend themselves less well to positivistic kinds of representation. And so I think both examples, we can talk about uh, examples of these, um, these binaries that, that construct a spatial um, object on which experts can act. So in terms of representational geographies, um, actual maps like this or uh, one that I absolutely thought was really fascinating, it was, um, I think Nora might have been there, the American University of Kuwait's uh, conference I don't know if you were at that one two years ago, which had a really beautiful brochure with a cover uh, in which um, iconic buildings from all the big cities in the, in the Gulf, like Riyadh and Dubai and Qatar and so on, were melded into this Manhattan-like um, uh, sort of sky, sky, how do you call it? skyline, right? And uh, th that was taken as like the image of the urban. What does it mean to be urban in the Gulf? High rises, international style, Norman Foster, right? Um, what does that connote? really great, super brilliant rulers. They're so modern, but they're also tribal, and they, they, they're, the way they're modern is because they hire Norman Foster, right, to build buildings. Um, so that, that was one example. But also if you look at uh, other kinds of seemingly very different discourses, like when people talk about what we've lost, the village, the Farij, right? It used to be like this, now everyone doesn't know each other. It used to be, you knew the passport control guy at the airport, <laughs> now it's some anonymous bureaucrat. Those more, no, what we call non-representational kinds of geographies, right, are also ways, they, they, they inform, they inform um, expert knowledge uh, on the, er, the Gulf city, right? So those kinds of discourses turn into um, expert discourses about authenticity and about who belongs and doesn't belong, right? Uh, maybe I, I give a rough figure, and this is anecdotal, but I, if I counted it, maybe it's, it's a, I can be more specific. Probably 80% of the um, architectural and urban planning kinds of papers that are given at any conference, at least, um, talk about the Gulf society as only people who are Gulf Arab people, right? Those are the only, that's the people that we're referring to. 90% of the people are not referred to at all, right? There is no working class, right? Apparently, in the Gulf, right? There's no such thing. Uh, how does that happen, right? Um, so these kinds of questions we need to be asking more seriously, more rigorously, with a more theoretical, with a more serious theoretical um, um, a theoretical uh, engagement. We should look at the settings, the context, as I've been clearly suggesting, suggesting here, the context of knowledge production, the, the seminars, the conferences, the architectural settings, the projects um, that, uh, that, um, that produce and reproduce these images and produce and reproduce or, or produce spaces in the Lefebvre and André Lefebvre sense of the term. Running through and organizing much, if not all of this, is a central thread, the category of the city, as I've been suggesting. The Gulf, it is said, is an urban region, a construction that unconsciously deploys the concept of the city, uh, as, uh, of the city as an object of knowledge, a space of a kind of selective cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism to whose production and on whose behalf only experts under the patronage of a wise and generous ruler are entitled to act and to speak. 
It stands against what I've been saying as the, what is categorized as the non-modern Middle East, North Africa, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Gulf city in this construction has problems, but those problems lend themselves only to technocratic and academic expert solutions. Um, is, am I okay on time, by the way? Okay, so how much more do you think? Oh, I should just keep going? Okay, great, great. Oh, great, great. Um, so what kind of urban knowledge is produced in this context? Is it one that highlights and naturalizes, for example, consumption of global commodities as a source of well-being, or one in which rights, discourses, organize, and perhaps contain the politics of labor, or one that closes off possibilities for alternative modes of urbanism? Who invokes the city and, and in what contexts? And how are they acting to frame and transform reality by this? Does it matter that a region long stereotyped as archaic or Bedouin, quote unquote, is suddenly stereotyped as hyper modern and super, uh, hyper urban and super modern? What kinds of legitimacy are confirmed by urbanizing the Gulf in this way? I talk about this in a section of uh, the book mentioned by Ali Reza, call, uh, I call Reverse Orientalism, and I can talk about that a bit later in the Q&A. Um, those are some of the themes I think we should pursue with much more theoretical engagement. Another one is the theme of so-called sustainability, and some uh, which falls under a larger category that some people have been talking about recently, the, anth the so-called Anthropocene, uh, a, co a concept that I haven't really pursued very carefully, so I don't have any stakes in this whole notion of is there such a thing as an Anthropocene or what uses can we make of it. But I think it's worthwhile to pursue this actually um, and to look at how we can look at the Gulf or reframe the Gulf through the category of the Anthropocene if that's a productive thing to do. Um, so basically the Anthropocene talks about the relationship between, um, uh, between the human and the environmental and we can see, um, um, we can see that you know there are many many conversations, discourses, expert knowledges that are organized or say that they're organized around the, 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 the idea of, of human-induced environmental change. Um, however, this has, been, this has come under the sign generally of sustainability, which has in practice lent itself to highly privatized and often neoliberal forms of urbanism, whether we're talking about the global north or the global south, whether we're talking about the United States or the Arab Gulf. Um, as, the, as my colleague uh, Amelia Moore, who's working on this uh, in the context of the Caribbean, has said, the Anthropocene, uh, she summarizes it, is, is um, connects to the pervas quote, pervasive influence of human activities on planetary systems and bio, uh, biogeochemical processes. The Arab Gulf region has often been described as a place where urbanism takes no account of the Earth's depleting resources and the environmental damage that is caused by intensive oil consumption. Whether this is an accurate stereotype, the truth is probably more complicated. It is incorrect to assume that we can extract the Gulf from analyses organized around the categories such as the Anthropocene or global warming or however we formulate the problem. Even in the early 2000s, when I was doing most of my earlier field work, local concerns were often voiced in the media and by my own interlocutors about what the kinds of, what the kinds of urbanism, the high rises, the golf courses, the land reclamation projects, the car centric cities of the Gulf meant for the environment. Like many North Americans, Gulf people often expressed feeling torn between the impersonal forces that have shaped the society in which they lived and their own desires for what they too called sustainability. The discourse of sustainability, of course, is highly problematic, as I've mentioned, and rather conveniently aligned with neoliberal logics. Um, that is a topic that has uh, been addressed by many others, and um, I can't address it here um, for, for reasons of time or my own expertise. I would like to raise a more discreet issue uh, as, again, an invitation for future research. In a recent essay in, a mass, uh, in the mass media, a UAE a United Arab Emirates citizen and blogger wrote that the Gulf city is, quote, the, this is in the context of the post-Arab uprisings and so on, the Gulf city is, quote, the nerve center of the contemporary Arab world's culture, commerce, design, 
architecture, art, and academia, attracting hundreds of thousands of Arab immigrants, uh, including academics, businessmen, journalists, athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals." End quote. This is a summary of what I've been calling the semantic field of the urban in the Gulf, and I would like to suggest that in establishing the conditions by which we think by which we think of the Gulf city as a city of neoliberal professionals, this field limits the ways in which the Gulf engages the question of the Anthropocene, or global warming, what ha what, whichever you prefer. And so privileging the neoliberal and, professional, uh, neoliberal professional and expert, what sorts of engagements with climatic issues are made thinkable, and what sorts are made far less likely? What productive avenues for new kinds of urbanism are anticipated, for example, by Norman Foster's Mustar? Should it ever be even completed? Or the other less celebrated interventions into the problems of sustainability that occur in the various knowledge production settings that I've discussed here. Here, let me again cite um, the Caribbeanist, uh, my Caribbeanist colleague, um, Amelia Moore. As a Caribbeanist, she works on islands, and, and of course, those islands, as we know, are under threat, and she's very, uh, her interlocutors are way more attentive to these questions. So she writes, quote, I would like to caution against the potentially unhelpful uses of the Anthropocene idea. The term should not become a brand signifying a specific style of anthropological research. It should not gloss over rigid solidifications of time, space, the human, or life. We should, we should not celebrate creativity in the Anthropocene while ignoring instances of stark social differentiation and capital accumulation, just as we should not focus on Anthropocene assemblages as only hegemonic in the oppressive sense." End quote. So does the emergence of the Anthropocene as both, as both a source of concern and knowledge production in the Gulf avoid or go beyond the temptation to brand, to which this notion, as more, as more rightly warns us, is all too susceptible? Are Gulf engagements posing fresh productive and productive responses to the, quote, rigid solidifications of time, space, the human or life? Or do they simply ignore stark social differentiations and promote the agendas of capital accumulation? On the other hand, to again follow Moore's uh, argument, we should be cautious, she writes, with our utilization of the crisis rhetoric surrounding events in the Anthropocene, recognizing that crisis for some can be turned into multiple forms of opportunity for others. Representations of the gulf as symptomatic or symbolic of the apocalyptic telos of capitalism, as exemplified by Mike Davis's notion of evil paradises and David Harvey's comment about the, what he calls the criminally absurd urbanism of the region, should be avoided. These, this rhetorical genre traffics in the kinds of arid apocalyptic crisis discourse identified by Moore, and to which both the Anthropocene as an alibi and the Gulf as a symbol or symptom seem to lend themselves. We should rather see the Gulf as very much engaged in the Anthropocene moment, in ways shaped by its historical legacies of empire, dynastic politics, resource extraction, its own localizations of global and neoliberal capitalism, as well as the more impersonal factors of its geology and physical geography. We should avoid falling into the trap of employing anthropocentric discourses to exoticize the region or to impose it on it a zombie logic of capitalism supposedly predetermined by the past let alone, and worse, by the nature, by the putative moral character of, or cultural personality of its peoples. The Gulf remains, I'm almost, this is my conclusion. The Gulf remains a marginalized and even, unfashion, even unfashionable area of research in the Western Middle East, Middle East Studies Academy. In spite of, or maybe because of this marginality, the region offers an interesting vantage point uh, from which to excuse me, the, the Gulf offers an interesting vantage point for reflecting upon the production of knowledge about generally ignored arenas of urbanism and uh, the Anthropocene. Every discipline is organized around both the legitimacy and prestige of its objects of knowledge, which in turn constitute a precondition, uh, precondition of the given discipline's process of, of knowledge production. The frame of knowledge production casts into relief discourses of the city in the Middle East, and particularly the Gulf, uh, over the past decade. 
The marginality both of the Gulf and the question of the urban and wider Middle East studies contrasts strikingly with the emphasis on the urban in Gulf studies itself and invites a number of questions. Why is the urban so central in Gulf studies? How and when does it become so central? How does it organize, focus, and distribute power and resources, historiography, and cultural capital, and other arenas of public concern, such as the environment and the Anthropocene? The question of knowledge production also helps us wrap our heads around seemingly unwieldy and metaphysical questions. What do we mean when we use the term city? And how does this category operate politically and intellectually? In that, grappling with knowledge production uh, of and within Gulf cities can help us to clear away a lot of the theoretical morass around questions of urbanism in the social sciences and opens possibilities for engaging larger questions of urbanism in the global south and beyond. Thank you.